the Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson Wax products for home and industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn and Phil Leslie, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. Do you know that the use of wax is a very old custom? The old Romans and Greeks both used it on such things as the prows of their ships and their shields. The ancient Egyptians used wax to protect their paintings. In fact, that's why some of those old murals have come down to us so well preserved. The fine furniture made by Sheraton was wax protected. Also the floors of beautiful old French chateaus. So it was natural for us to use wax extensively in our own homes, on our floors, furniture, woodwork, and for many other things, such as leather goods, Venetian blinds, picture frames, and lampshades. It was the makers of Johnson's Wax who studied waxes scientifically and produced the perfect uniform blend to give you greatest beauty, maximum protection, and ease of use. You can now buy this famous Johnson's Wax in three forms, paste, liquid, or cream. It's used by good housekeepers the world over. It is secretly believed in some circles that the Elks and various other men's clubs were organized by women to get their men out of the way so they could do their housework in peace. And here at 79 Wistful Vista, one of them is trying to get her spouse out of the house. As we meet, Fibber McGee and Molly. <laughs> Go on, McGee. Get out. Go on. Scoot. Mother has work to do. Yeah, but where'll I go? Oh, go to a movie. I'd like to have you see the one at the Bijou. Well, what is it? I don't know, but I'd like to have you see it. <laughs> Look, dearie, Buell and I are cleaning house, and you're underfoot like a fallen arch. Oh, well, I'll keep out of the way. I always lift my feet when you want to vacuum under me, don't I? Well, it isn't your feet, dearie. I want your whole big, beautiful, handsome, well-knit body out of here. <laughs> Whiz, I, I just can't walk the streets, can I? Well, go to the public library and read a good book. A good long book. Yeah. The only good long book they got is Anthony Adverse. And that's out. How do you know? I got it. <laughs> I'm scared to return it because I owe $77.12 on it. Well, uh, maybe they'll make an adjustment. Yeah, that's what the trainer at the Elks did when I sprained my neck playing handball. He made an adjustment, and for three weeks I walked around with my head under my left arm. <laughs> well, if the trainer at the Elks... The Elks, that's it. Why don't you go down to the club? I thought you says I've been spending too much time down there. Oh, I say the silliest things. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful institution, really. Go on, sweetheart. Go on down to the Elks. Hmm? And when you get home with your lungs full of cigar smoke and your pants full of pool chalk... I'll have my housework all done. <laughs> okay, okay, but you talked me into it, remember? And it may be expensive, too. We play pee pool for a nickel a point. <laughs> Dearie, today I don't care if you play drop the handkerchief for nine dollars a drop. <laughs> all Buell and I want around here is nobody. Well, on second thought, I don't think I'd better go. It looks a little like, kind of like rain. Oh, dear. Well, maybe you can get a ride with somebody. Alice is going to the airplane plant very shortly, and the car that picks her up goes right past the Elks. Say, that isn't a bad idea. I'll ask Alice if Oh, she... here she is now, McGee. Hello, Alice, dear. Hello, Mrs. McGee, Mr. McGee. Hi, kid. Look, you're leaving pretty quick for the airplane plant, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm getting there early today because I have to instruct some new employees in how to adjust a centrifugal equalizer on the universal compensator in the hydraulic midsection booster gear. Oh. <laughs> they always have trouble getting the lock flange clearance past the binder flap. You don't say. Mm. <laughs> How ridiculous. 
Incidentally, Alice, that's an awful cute suit of coveralls you're wearing. Oh, thank you. I designed these myself, Mrs. McGee. The only coveralls I could buy made me look like I'd been smuggling wheelbarrows. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty sharp outfit, kid. What's that little pocket on the side there? Oh, that's where I keep my lipstick and compact and mirror and comb. It was my own idea. Yeah, but why is the pocket sewed up so that you can't get at them? Well, that was my boss's idea. He said they could assemble four bombers while I was correcting nature's mistakes. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm ready to go whenever you are, Alice. Go where, Mr. McGee? Well, he wants to ride as far as the Elks cl- uh, Club with you, Alice. You got a car picking you up, haven't you, Alice? Why, uh, why, yes, Mr. McGee, but Creepers, it isn't mine. It's a fellow who works at the plants car, and it's his turn for the carpool this week. Well, McGee doesn't care, Alice. He'll ride with anybody. Why, sure. Sure. What do I care if I'm seen riding along with a bunch of people in working clothes? Why? Why, some of those people might be just as good as I am. Oh, now, Mr. McGee, let's not go all to pieces about it. Well, they are. In fact, kid, when a fellow of my standing mixes with the working classes, that's democracy at its best. (laughs) And that's egotism at its worst. (laughs) Well, anyway, Mr. McGee, it's only a coupe, and there are six of us in the carpool. There wouldn't be room for you. Ah, pshaw. Crowding doesn't bother me. I'm no snob. Don't crowd yourself in if it makes everybody uncomfortable, dearie. Oh, well, it isn't that, Mrs. McGee, but it would be so hard on the tires it would defeat the whole purpose of carpooling. What do you mean? Well, the the whole idea is to conserve cars. There's a terrible shortage of new tires and cars and gasoline, and it'll get worse. Didn't you know that already over four million cars have had to be scrapped? Heavenly days, four million. I don't believe it. I think somebody's got the figures all wrong. Why, Mr. McGee? Because I read the other day that the average car traveling from home to work carries an average of two and a half people. I read that, and that's ridiculous. It's got to be either two people or three people. (laughs) Just half a people just don't make sense. Well, just the same, dearie, Alice is right. They formed that carpool with six people to save the use of five other cars. And if you overload this car, it certainly won't help anything. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. McGee. Oh, that's okay, kid. I ain't wanted to push myself in where I'm not wanted. I was merely trying to catch... Oh, and there's my car now. Goodbye, Mr. McGee and Mrs. McGee. Goodbye, dear. Uh, Here's your tool chest, Alice. I'll pick it up for you. Ooh, what do you got in there? Sledgehammers? No, just my lunch. Just your lunch? Then why is it so heavy? My gosh, I... Oh, oh, here you are. I had my foot on it. Uh, well, I've got to run. Goodbye now. I'm sorry we can't take you, Mr. McGee. Personally, I just love to drop you off someplace. Uh, fine state of how do you do. Can't even get a ride downtown. I got plenty of rides during the last war. Well, in the last war, we didn't have any B-29s using more gas in an hour than an average driver uses in five years, dearie. Why don't you take the streetcar down to the Elks? What? Spend a nickel just for a little short trip? No, sir It's reckless spending like that that leads to inflation. <laughs> Betcha. I'll get me a ride with somebody. Hand me my magazine, will you? What magazine? The one on the hall table. The one on victory gardening. What's the name of it? The Weeder's Digest. <laughs> All right, George, I'll just sit here and I'll get me a ride down the Billy Mills in the orchestra and the sweetheart of all my dreams.
over to the other chair, McGee. I want to back him where you are. What'd you say? I said, will you please move so I can back him where you are? I can't hear you. I said, will you please move over to the other chair so I can back him here? Oh, oh, sure. I'll sit over here. Thank you. What? I said, thank you. I can't hear you. I said, thank you. Oh. You're welcome. What? I said, you're welcome. I can't hear you. I said, you're welcome. Oh. <laughs> Look, dearie, this is what I was afraid of when I suggested you go down to the Elks. I'm getting housemaid's thumb turning this vacuum cleaner on and off. Oh, my gosh, I can't... Have... Oh, dear, peek out and see who that is, dearie. Okay. Uh-oh, it's Mrs. Carstairs. Oh, it's an informal call, though. She's wearing her dirty old last year's emeralds. <laughs> Now, be nice to her, McGee. She can't help it if she's worth several million dollars. Oh, I don't hold her money against her. Only thing in my mind is she always looks at me like I just crawled out of a hole in an apple. Well, my goodness. Come in. Well, if this isn't a surprise. Why, you knew... Good day, Mrs. Carstairs. <laughs> How do you do, Mrs. McGee? So glad to find you at home. Hi, Carstia. Say, we had a wonderful time at your house the other night. At, uh, at my home? Yes. You know, at the reception you gave for Leopold Cadenza, the violinist? Oh? Oh, yes, to be sure. And say, he certainly can play the violin, Mrs. Carstairs. He can play two guitars on a fiddle and make it sound like five banjos on a pipe organ. <laughs> yes, yeah, the old saying goes, it's wonderful what beautiful sounds you can get by pulling the tail of a horse across the insides of a cat. <laughs> Leopold has a genuine Stradivarius violin, you know. Is that so? Over 300 years old. Well, my goodness. Nobody would ever suspect it. Sounds just as good as a new one. <laughs> uh, quite, quite. Hey, Karsty, if you're going past the Elks Club, I'll bum a ride with you. What a perfectly descriptive phrase under the circumstances. <laughs> but I regret to say, Mr. McGee, I haven't my own car today. I'm driving the station wagon. My gosh, really? What precinct? I know the captain at the 14th very well. <laughs> if I go with you, can I ring the gong? I always wanted to ride oh, the front seat. Oh, McGee. Huh? She didn't say a paddy wagon. She said a station wagon. Oh. You know what a station wagon is. Oh. That's a truck that city people buy when they move to the country to show the country people they're from the city. <laughs> Anyway, Mr. McGee, this station wagon is the property of the Red Cross. I just stopped here because it was on my way to headquarters. We are not permitted to use it for anything but official business. Oh, that's okay, Karsty. We can make it official. I'll stop in and roll a couple of bandages. How would that be? Slightly septic, I'm afraid. <laughs> this car saving business is really important, isn't it, Mrs. Carstairs? My dear, you have no idea. Automobiles are wearing out at a simply appalling rate. People absolutely must use their cars only for necessary driving. Save them in every way possible. Mr. Carstairs and I use our own car very sparingly, I assure you. You mean you got to make the Carstairs car last because it's the Carstairs last car, eh, Carsty? <laughs> I, uh... Yes. <laughs> uh, that was neatly phrased, Mr. McGee. Yes, it was put very... Well? Well, what, Mrs. McGee? Well, will you give me a lift down to the Elks? Mr. McGee, I'm very sorry, but you remember what Thomas Jefferson said to Alexander Hamilton? No, I don't. Neither do I. Isn't that irritating? <laughs> well, good day, Mrs. McGee. Good day, Mrs. Carstairs. Why, that triple-chinned old crumpet. Who does she think she is not giving me a lift? She had time to stop in here on a social call, didn't she? Yeah, but that took no extra gas or tires, dearie. And besides, she probably has to stop and pick up some other Red Cross workers. Well, so what? Well, rules are rules, and if they broke them for you, everybody would be breaking them for everybody else. Well, my gosh, I'm entitled to ride in somebody's car, pooling or no pooling. Look at the gas and tires we're saving the government by not even owning a car. <laughs> well, that's a fairly negative hunk of war effort, sweetheart. <laughs> Oh, well, what was I about to... Oh, yes, I was going to... Hello, folks. Oh, hi, Junior. Hello, Mr. Wilcox. Excuse the looks of things. I'm doing a bit of house cleaning. <laughs> well, there's your opening, kiddo, if I ever heard one. <laughs> what do you mean, pal? What do I mean? <clears throat> okay, Waxy, skip it. Hey, you got your car with you? No, I left it outside. <laughs> 
you're driving today, Mr. Wilcox. He's mm. been trying to hitchhike downtown all day, but for every hike, there seems to be a hitch. Well, <clears throat> I've got the company car outside there, Molly. Hey, take a look at it, by the way. Wow, you must swing a little influence with the OPA, Junior. That's a new car, isn't it? Nope. Just went over it with a little Johnson's car to you and took all the grime off it. He wouldn't care if it was crusted with mud, Mr. Wilcox. You know, he's got to the point where he'd ride downtown on the running board of a pogo stick. <laughs> Where are you going, pal? Elks Club, Junior. Elks? Yes, Elks. E-L-K from the Ottawa Indian word, Elkawatapasican. Uh, meaning what? Elk. <laughs> Not. I don't go within several blocks of there. Well, you can, can't you? You can steer, can't you? Your car don't run on a track, does it? <laughs> Look, you don't understand, pal. If it was my personal car, I'd drive you any place inside of my A coupons. But this car is strictly for commercial purposes. I don't go anywhere that isn't between places of business. Even so, it's wearing out pretty fast. Certainly doesn't look at Mr. Wilcox. Well, that's that car new treatment, Molly. All I do is put Johnson's car new on with a clean cloth, wait till it dries, and wipe it off. Really brings back that salesroom glitter, doesn't it? <laughs> car new, you know, cleans and polishes in one application. Ah, well, handsome is as handsome does, I always says, Junior. You going to give me a lift or not? Not. Oh. Much as I'd like to do you a favor, pal, I'd rather do Eisenhower and MacArthur a favor just now. Do you realize that the stockpile of new cars is down to what would have been a two-day supply before the war? Have you heard that there are 23 million cars on the road today, and if the number falls to 21 million, our transportation troubles will be something horrible? My transportation troubles are something horrible right now, Junior. <laughs> Gee whiz, here I'm... Well, trying... I'm really sorry, pal. I don't want to be stuffy about it, but I won't drive this car ten feet out of its way. Of course not. Relax, McGee. Oh, well... But what I stopped in for, Molly, was to give you a couple of complimentary tickets to the ice carnival at the stadium next Friday. You like ice skating, as I remember it? Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Wilcox. Yes, I love ice skating. Yeah, me too. I was goalie for the Peoria Hot Shots for three seasons. You ever play hockey, Junior? Did I play hockey? Why, one winter in Omaha, when I was a kid, I skipped school three days out of five. See you later, friends. <laughs> He had that confused with Hookie, didn't he? Mm, he's got everything confused, including me. Great bunch of friends I got. Wouldn't give a ride for three blocks if I was carrying the San Francisco delegate's piggyback. Oh, you're just talking, McGee. Oh. You know as well as anybody how important this car conservation thing is. Nobody's picking on you. Well, maybe not. But today of all days when I simply got to get down to the elf. What for? Because, I, well, there's a certain... I have... Well, gee whiz, you wanted me to go, didn't you? Just to get you out from underfoot, pet. But it doesn't matter now. Stick around. No, sirree. I got my back up now. I'm going to go downtown if I have to walk on my hands. And I may stay down for dinner, too. Hey, what are we going to have for dinner here? I don't know. I'll ask Beulah. Oh, Beulah! Beulah! Somebody ball for Beulah? <laughs> Look, Beulah, I may eat downtown tonight if we haven't got something pretty enticing here. What are we having, Beulah? Well, ma'am, I ain't had much time to prepare no luscious repast, but we're going to do all right. <laughs> it's chicken croquets and cream gravy and fresh green peas and walled up salad, bacon powder biscuits and a deep dish cherry pie was possible to get together. I'd do it, but it ain't, so we haven't baked beef. <laughs> That does it. You're staying downtown? No, I'll be here. I love baked beans. <laughs> Lots of molasses, Beulah? Mr. McGee, sir, if them beans had eyebrows, they'd be in molasses up to them. <laughs> we still have half a chocolate cake, haven't we, Beulah? No, ma'am. You see, Ira dropped in to see me last night and established a beachhead on that cake. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Why, certainly not, Beulah. The way to a man's heart is between his teeth. <laughs> I hope a taste of that cake convinced him you're a wonderful cook. Oddly enough, so it did. What was so odd about it, Beulah? I didn't beg it, ma'am. You did. Oh. <laughs> You're engaged to Ira, aren't you, Beulah? Well, not formally, sir. So. <laughs> he realized before he can pop a question, he'd better question Papa. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that corny? <laughs> Will your father be in favor of it, Beulah? Well, ma'am, Papa, he got to know things. He asked questions. Papa, he old newspaper man, you know. An old newspaper man, eh? Retired? Yeah, sir. He found there was no money in old newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> anyway, before he go let Ira 
were to marry his little gal, he's going to be sure I was in a position to support me in a manner to which I would dearly love to become accustomed. <laughs> well, uh, what if he finally says no? Then us elopes, ma'am. Uh-uh. Be careful with that eloping business, Beulah. Don't be hasty. You know the old story. Out the window and down the ladder, and you might wind up in Reno, Nevada. <laughs> Kind of corny too, isn't it? <laughs> I love that man. The King's Man and the Choo Choo Polka. The brakeman gave a downbeat by shouting, All aboard! To a polka rhythm. The choo-choo engine roared, 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 roared. pretty well along with the housework now. You don't have to go at the elk. I know I don't, but I'm gonna. This thing has become a challenge to me. I'll go down there now if all the members were after me with sawed-off shotguns. Come to think of it, some of them are. Why? Oh, just because at one of their luncheons, some practical joker with more time than brains scraped all the meringue off the lemon pies and put shaving cream on them. <laughs> yeah, and they think it was me that did it. Why, that's silly. You'd know better than to do a silly thing like that. I do now, anyway. <laughs> that shaving cream cost me 40 cents a two. But as I was saying, if nobody will give me a lift down to the Elks, I'll be forced to simply get... Oh, come in. Oh, hello, Dr. Gamble. Hello, Molly. Hello, gopher puss. <laughs> Hi, a subtractinoid. Subtractinoid? Sure, same as adenoid, only you take them out. <laughs> Now that that witty exchange is over, how have you been, Doctor? Oh, fine, Molly. Nothing the matter with me that 96 hours sleep and $100,000 wouldn't fix. Mm -hmm. Humanity would be better off if you had $96 and went to sleep for 100,000 hours. <laughs> Say, I almost forgot, Doctor. Have you seen your office nurse in the last few hours? Miss Bingham? No. Why? She left some keys here for you. Said you'd forgotten, left them on your desk. Here they are, Doctor. Oh, thank you very much. I need these. Hmm? Keys to my office, my locker at the hospital, my house, and a couple of other things. Was there any message? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, there was. Go on, tell him, Molly. Yeah, sure, tell me. Nothing Miss Bingham could say would surprise me. She's disappointed in love, as who isn't. <laughs> well, all she said was, uh, please give these seven keys to ball paint. <laughs> By the way, Doc, you going downtown from here? Yes, I am, Sonny. Do Why? Do you go past the Elks Club, Doctor? Within five feet of the door, my dear. Close enough so they could reach out and slap me with my long overdue dues. Now, look, Doc, you mind if I go along with you? Not a bit, my boy, not a bit. 
We can have a very intelligent little chat on the way. Oh, fine. If you can manage to keep your ignorant trap shut and let me do the talking. <laughs> well, well, at last, McGee, you finally did it. Yeah, I sure did, didn't I? Well, come on, Doc, old pal, let's get going. I gotta get down to the Elks. Got a big billiard game lined up. Oh, fine. Mm -hmm. Hope there's no money riding on it. With a billiard cue, you're as clumsy as a cub bear with 90 feet of barbed wire. Mm, I always heard he played a pretty good game of billiards, Doctor. From whom did you hear that? From him. <laughs> I can play the pants off you, Arrowsmith. I've seen you play. And you couldn't hit three cushions if you were laying on a sofa with a tennis racket. Listen to the poor man's willy hoppy. Why, I... Ah, play... no, no. Ha, ha. Look, boys, I don't like to break up what looks like the beginning of a beautiful enmity, but if you're going to be back for dinner, McGee, you better get going. Yeah, I guess I better have it that. Well, come on, Doc, old pal. All right. Good day, Doctor. Hurry back, dearie. Okay, I'll split my winnings with you, Molly. Don't count your chickens before you lay your eggs, Bantam. Bye, Molly. I sure appreciate this, Doc. Appreciate what? You're taking me as far as the Elks. I have a reason for it, buddy. If people can see me on good terms with one of my patients, it'll quiet a lot of nasty rumors. Hmm. <laughs> you know, you're the first person I met today that acted human. It's a great act, isn't it? Some, sometimes I wonder how I do it. Without makeup, too. Well, what I mean is I've been getting the brush off all day. Pushed around like a set of checkers. It's too bad. <laughs> Boy, you sure parked a long way from the house, Doc. I did indeed. <laughs> My gosh. Where is your car? In front of the Elks. <laughs> In front? Oh, this is ridiculous. When you meet an old friend, you give him a friendly smile and a hand clasp. Have you ever stopped to think that a friend's first glimpse of your home is like that first friendly smile? That's why colorful linoleum, kept beautifully polished with Johnson's Glow Coat, is so appropriate in your front entrance hall or outside vestibule. With Glow Coat, you can keep all your linoleum surfaces glistening with a minimum of work. From the letters of praise that I see myself, I know that Glow Coat has outstanding popularity the world over. It's recommended by linoleum manufacturers themselves. Glow Coat needs no rubbing or buffing. Takes practically no work from you. Simply apply and let dry and come back in 20 minutes to find your floors smiling at you. Regular care with Johnson's self-polishing Glow Coat adds greatly to the life of your linoleum. Use it on asphalt or rubber tile and finished wood floors, too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today there are more than two million American-made military vehicles running on American-made rubber tires. And mostly they don't run on modern concrete highways. They run in ruts and over rocks, through forests, and across the ruins of towns and cities. Three out of five of those tires don't wear out. They're cut to pieces. That's one of the many reasons we have to conserve tires. And the needs of our armed forces for gasoline is tremendous. 25 million gallons a day. Which is why we have to use as little gasoline as possible here at home. So pool your car wherever possible. The kind of car pooling that me really means something is where members rotate the use of their cars and ride together. So see if you can't adjust your necessary traveling to car pooling. You know, our fighting forces are getting places by smart planning, and so can we. Good night. Good night, all. <laughs> This is Marla Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company.